Good evening. I want to welcome you to a Wednesday evening special edition of Unshackled. In just a little while, we'll be featuring the story of Mikkel Millard, a story that's brought to you by the Pacific Garden Mission out of Chicago, Illinois. And these dramatizations are true stories of real live people. They are created and produced at the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, Illinois in front of a live audience and the stories are told in detail precisely how they happened I hope you'll take the time just to sit back and relax and enjoy this evening I know I will I haven't heard this story and I'm anxiously awaiting to hear it along with you before we go any further, I do want to say uh, thank you. On Monday Monday night, we had Kenzel Evans with us, who wrote the book Breaking the Silence, and he did a fine, fine job, Breaking the Silence. You can purchase that book at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, uh, Tower.com, and uh, AuthorHouse.com. And uh, when you go to Amazon, just, just type in there, Kenzel Evans, K-E-N-Z-E-L-L. -L. His last name is Evans, E-V-A-N-S. Get a copy of that book, sit down and listen, because you'll hear the man's heartbeat. He went through some things that you and I will never, never even imagine of going through. But he came out on the other side. Last night, we were delighted to have Major Cofty. Now he goes by. Uh, you can address <laughs> you can address Major Cofty several ways. You can address him as Major, because he he was a major in the United States Marine Corps. He was a Mustanger, and for you that do not know what a Mustanger is, is he came through the ranks. And at one time, as he said last night on Monday, on a Monday he was a staff sergeant in E6. On Tuesday, he was a second lieutenant. And so he is an enlisted man that became an officer. He was a Mustanger who served 22 years in the Marine Corps. So you can call him Major or you can call him Reverend Cofty because he is an evangelist. He has pastored churches. He has led congregations. You can call him Mr. And his real name I mean, these others are real, too, but, I mean, his uh, his name is Chuck Cofty. We had a delightful time last night. He had me laughing. <clears throat> he had me crying. Uh, we, went, we went through several emotions around here last night, and I'm sure that some of our listeners did, too. But that's all right, because that's what the George Espen Love Show is all about, real people talking about real things that makes a real difference. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. You might ask me the question, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that when we come back. But you know what? Being as this is a special edition of Unshackled tonight, and we'll take you into the story here in just a little bit, I think it would be good for everybody just to kind of loosen up, whether you're at home or uh, riding down the road in your car and you're listening on your tablet or on your iPhone or your droid or whatever. I think it would just be a good time to just loosen up and enjoy yourself. <music>
I hope your Wednesday went well here in this great, great, big state of Delaware. <laughs> we are getting rain by the bucketfuls. The creeks are rising. Some of the roads are going under. Trees have fallen down. Limbs have broken. Thus far, we still have the electricity on here in our area. Down closer to the beach, Route 1 in certain places went underwater. They've closed it. When high tide comes in about uh, 345 this morning, they are expecting uh, some of the places. In fact, they have uh, told people to, uh, you better get out because when the high tide comes in at 345 this morning, uh, all access roads will be underwater and where you're at will be underwater so uh we we are getting getting drenched it it raining sideways uh and it is raining bucketfuls but all in all we're warm we're dry we still got the lights on as i mentioned before and uh we're not uh we're not as in bad a shape as those folks that got pounded with the snow we're getting the rain and the beach erosion and the flooding and all those things that come with these winter storms but you know keep your chin up keep looking up because spring is just around the corner i think it's the next corner i hope it is the next corner so all in all everyone is faring well i want to say this before we go any further this evening some of you may ask uh Espen Lub, what 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 in the world is going on? <laughs> Why in the middle of the week all of a sudden are you having this uh, special edition of Unshackled? A Wednesday evening special edition of Unshackled. And I would have to tell you I don't really know. But on the other hand, I do know. I can't explain it, but on the other hand, I could explain it. Now that you're shaking your head, maybe even tapping your forehead, let me continue. I don't want to do it, but I want to do it. I don't understand it but I do understand it very well. Now I really have you shaking your head. But listen, don't 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 turn us don't turn us off. Don't turn us off. You see, in order for you to fully understand what I'm saying, you have to know what what's behind it and how it has come to this point where we're at right now. Which isn't the point that we will stay at because we have much further to go. I know I'm not making a lick of sense to some of you. Maybe none of you. But maybe someday one of these evenings, I'll sit down and have a chat with my listeners and tell you what's behind the whole thing. When we do these unshackled programs, and we've been doing them for, what, five weeks now, somewhere around there, four or five weeks, and we've had a couple during the week when we when we do these all I want to do is put them on the board Charlie hit the buttons and off we go but when we attempt to do that we can't do that. There I go again. There I go again mixing y'all up. 
I don't feel worthy. I'm not worthy to do this by no means. I mean by no stretch of the imagination. I am not worthy to do this. And I have been wrestling these last two or three weeks. I have been wrestling and I haven't said anything to anyone. I'm running my big mouth to my listeners for the first time. I haven't said anything until now. I have been wrestling of what to do with this radio show. I'm talking about the whole George Espinlob show. Things are wonderful. We are reaching people. Our audience is growing. We are getting response. I mean, from, from east, north, south, west. We're getting response from people, <clears throat> excuse me, down the street, around the corner, across this great nation, and around the world. And I'm not exaggerating one bit. Our guests that we have had on our shows have been incredible, incredible, and there's more to come. And I said, I don't know, several months ago, maybe four or five months ago, whenever I said it, I said, this radio show is going somewhere. I have no idea where it's going, but something is taking place that even I don't know about, but yet I do know about. I don't mean to confuse you. I'm going to shut up and we're going to move on here in, in, in just a minute. But I wanted to share that with you. You say, yeah, well, Espenlob, now you really got me. You really got me twisted. And I don't have the foggiest idea of what you're talking about. That's all right. Just hang in there with me. You've been hanging with me. You're hanging with me tonight. And people will come in and listen later. And we'll grow a bigger audience. Just keep hanging with me. And we'll see where it goes. Just keep an eye on Espenlob. Just keep an eye on him. <laughs> That's all I can say. Just keep an eye on him. I'm lost for words. Sit back and enjoy this. I'm going to shut up. There are times in life when it's cold outside And the skies are cloudy and gray When you're all alone and your friends are gone and the rain just won't go away Have a little faith whenever you're lonely Have a little faith whenever you're blue Have a little faith and trust in Him only And your Father will take care of you Faith and 
trust in him only and your father will take care of you if you ever doubt what your life's about and you're scared you won't make it through Let your heart be strong you are not alone for your father is always with you have a little faith whenever you are lonely have a little faith whenever you're blue have a little faith and trust in Trust in him only and your father will take care of you Yes your father will take care of you How do you do? An expert on human nature has said, We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. The man in this story walked in darkness for a very long time. Parental guidance is suggested due to the subject matter contained in this story. He survived horrific trauma growing up and found no justice. As a consequence, he left a path of destruction with bad decisions until his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Hello? Yes, it's true, my sister's dead. Wesley shot her. He's in jail. They arrested him right away. Yeah, the kids were home when it happened. So I brought them here. I'll call you later. The house is full of homicide investigators right now. Proclaiming the way, the truth, and the life. This is Unshackled, dramatizing true life stories produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Some have chosen the foolish things of the world the pursuit of pleasure that leads nowhere. But many homeless people suffer because of other hardships. Time and chance happens to them all. Regardless, Pacific Garden Mission is there for hundreds of men, women, and children, providing shelter and the chance for new life. Thanks to friends who care and send financial gifts, the old lighthouse offers nourishing meals, fresh clothing, and a clean, safe bunk for the night. Even medical and dental treatment is offered to resident guests in the Mission Clinic, all without charge. But the greatest free gift is that of new life, as pastors and counselors speak the truth in love, introducing them to the one who will never leave them or forsake them. Now for broadcast around the earth. Here is program number 3243 in the series, Unshackled. The program that makes you face yourself and think. Sorry about the interruption. Well, we've never investigated a murder before, so this is all new to us. I'm sorry that your children have to go through this, but we have to ask you all some questions. Michael, uh, let's start with you. How old are you? Fourteen. Uh, tell me what happened at your house tonight. Well, we got home from school, and Dad was there drinking a beer with Mom. Gary and I listened to them at the stairwell because Mom had a restraining order against him. Mm -hmm. And what was the gist of the conversation? Dad wanted to take Mom out to dinner, and she wouldn't go. We didn't feel any threat, so when my oldest brother, Cal, came in his truck, we went out to help him. 
Okay. Now, who was in the house at that time? Mom and Dad and my younger sisters. And then Dad stormed out, angry at Mom. He talked to Cal, and then he went back inside and started arguing with Mom. You could hear them? Yeah. Mom was telling him to leave and not to come back. Dad left us, so we all went back in the house. Cal went back to the farm where he lives, and the rest of us ran some errands. So Cal wasn't at your house when the shooting happened? No. He moved out a few months ago. Okay. Uh, what happened after that? When we came home, Dad showed up again. This time he had a shotgun. And what time was that? Around 6 o'clock. My brother Gary and I were outside. What happened next? Well, he, he tried to get us to shoot the gun, but we wouldn't do it. So he fired it at a barrel, and then he fired it into the ground. And then he went around back and into the house. I see. Now, who was in the house at that time? Mom and my three younger sisters. My 10-year-old sister, Amber, described how Dad squeezed under the chain in the back door and pushed Mom up against the kitchen counter, pinning her there with a shotgun. Amber grabbed my two-year-old sister, Rosie, and put her in Mom's car. When she went back in the house, Mom told her to run to the neighbors and call the police. With our seven-year-old sister, Joyce, in tow, she ran past us, yelling that Dad wouldn't let Mom out of the house. And what did you boys do then? Gary and I raced into the kitchen where we found Dad and Mom struggling. Gary tried to grab the shotgun while I tried to pry Dad's hand off Mom's arm. Dad tossed me across the room and I landed in front of the refrigerator. Oh, my. You boys were very brave. We wanted to protect Mom. She tried to get away but fell and Dad held her down. I reached around behind him and I pushed the safety on the gun from firing it. He let go of Mom and, and reset it. So I pulled the trigger, causing the gun to go off. It, it was pointed away from everyone, and I knew he'd have to reload, giving Mom time to run. All right. And then what? Mom told him to leave, and he did, leaving his shotgun behind. Wait, uh, he, he left his gun behind? Yeah. He went to his car and started backing out. So Gary ran outside to get Rosie out of Mom's car. And uh, you're Gary? Yes. How old are you? Thirteen. All right. Uh, Gary, then tell us what happened next. Dad didn't leave. He pulled his car around to the side of the house, got out, and came running toward the house. Mike locked the back door and the kitchen door. And your mother? She was calling the police when Dad kicked in the back door. The man in our story was 14 years old when his father killed his mother. This is the story of how that traumatic event altered his life. The true testimony of Michael Millard, right now on Unshackled. It's impossible to exaggerate the abusiveness of my drunken father. Verbally, physically, and emotionally, he destroyed the innocent trust of me and my five siblings. I was the second oldest of three brothers, and we had three younger sisters. When Dad was drunk, he would beat us, leaving us with welts and Mom with black eyes and missing hair on her head. Sometimes she was unable to walk. Finally, she got a restraining order and filed for divorce. Dad moved out, and life was peaceful for a while. Boy, it's great to eat a meal in peace. <laughs> We're eating better with Dad gone. He spent all the money on booze. And he let us go hungry. Yeah, I hated it when he'd come home with food, eat it right in front of us, and never give us a bite. I hated it when Grandma died and he wouldn't even let us cry at the funeral. How'd you stand it, Mom? I don't really know, son. You do what you have to. Well, he's gone now and I don't miss him, but I still miss your Grandma. Me too. I loved Grandma. She'd give us money for helping her, and Dad'd take it away from us, or, or make us give it back. We lost our place of safety from Dad when Grandma died. You won't have to run and hide now. He's out of our life. Not long after Dad left, my oldest brother took a job helping a local farmer and moved in with him. Then, my younger brother, Gary, decided to move in with Dad, leaving me the only male in the house. Mom was inconsolable. She hugged me and wept. <laughs> what am I going to do, Mike? There's nobody here to protect me. I don't know what your dad okay. might do. 
He said if he couldn't have me, nobody could. I'm, I'm, I'm here, Mom. I'll protect you. Please don't leave me. I won't. I promise, Mom. A few days later, my younger brother came back to live with us. Life was almost normal. For the first time, I could spend time with friends after school. But I could tell Mom was worried. Friday, April 23rd, was a beautiful spring day. When we got home from school, Dad was there, even though it wasn't his weekend for visitation. We understood why when he broke into the house. Mom grabbed the shotgun he'd left behind. So, Gary, as your dad came in the back door, your mother took your dad's shotgun to your sister's bedroom? Yes. Dad followed and knocked her down and got the gun. I managed to get the gun away from him. And where were you, Michael? I'd run to Mom's bedroom to grab my own shotgun. As I came back to the living room, I saw Gary running toward the door with, with Dad's gun. So I ran out ahead of him, and I fired my gun into the ground, and then I threw it down. Why? So Dad couldn't use it, and I could run faster. Well, then how did your mother get shot if both guns were outside? Dad's gun slipped out of my hand when I was running out of the house, and he got hold of it. And where did you go? I ran behind Dad's car and hid. And you, Mike? I ran behind the barn, and then I ran back to the house. I heard Mom struggling and saw Dad holding her down, so I rushed at him, and I knocked him off of her. He, he grabbed the shotgun, and he swung it at me. So I bolted out of the house and ran to the barn again while I was hiding. I heard the shotgun blast. Gary, were you still behind your dad's car? No. I was creeping around the outside of the house, peeking in the windows, trying to see where Dad was when I heard the shot. Did you see your father? Yes. I saw him with the shotgun, walking toward the back door. Mom was on the kitchen floor. I knew she was dead. I knew it, too. Did your father come out with the gun? Yeah. He hollered for us to come back in the house, but I moved further away into the tall grass so he couldn't see me. He finally went back inside. Yeah, uh, that's when I drove in. Okay, and for the record, you're the victim's brother, Andrew? Yes, uh, Gary came running to the car. He said, Mom's dead. Dad shot her. My brother jumped in my uncle's car, and they drove away. I never felt so alone as I did in that moment, fearing for my own life. Would Dad come after me? Then guilt soon flooded over me. I'd failed my mother. I had not kept my promise to stay and protect her. Would anyone come to rescue me? Who would protect me from my father? These questions would haunt me for years. In a moment, we'll hear what that experience for Michael was like. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, Women who come to the Women and Children's Division at Pacific Garden Mission learn diligence, patience, and kindness, among other virtues. The Women's Division is a place of refuge for women alone and those with children. They live in secure dormitories without fear of intrusion, where they find peace for their troubled souls. The mission has classes and counseling to help them gain confidence to return to society better equipped to take care of themselves and their children. School-aged children attend local schools near our facility. Even the children have Bible study at the mission. Through prayer and God's Word, every woman learns to adorn herself not with gold or costly array, but with good works. To learn more about this vital ministry to women, write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. As I waited, the police arrived and called for Dad to come out of the house. My uncle returned just as Dad appeared with his hands raised, and a sheriff handcuffed him. My uncle punched Dad in the face. I slipped inside to see Mom. She was lying in her blood. I knew she was dead. The policeman took my arm and led me to my uncle's car. He took the rest of us kids home with him. 
Investigators came with tape recorders, pencils, and legal pads and questioned us for hours. I hardly slept that night, but in the morning, life was almost normal. Uh, could I have another glass of chocolate milk? Yes, Mike. Well, we never had chocolate milk at home. The only cereal we had was cornflakes now and again. Yeah, people in town have been bringing groceries all morning, so uh, eat what you want. I wish I didn't have to go to school on Monday. Well, you don't have to go back right away, not, un not until you're ready. My uncle and aunt were very kind to us, but they had two children of their own, so it was stressful having all of us kids suddenly impact their lives. All but my little sister went to the funeral home to discuss arrangements. We wanted desperately to see our mother, so the funeral director agreed to an open casket as long as the veil covered mom. Two weeks later, I went back to school. In May, we four older kids had to face dad in district court for the preliminary hearing. What is it as bad as you thought? Seeing your dad again? He's not a bit sorry for what he did. No, he's not. His lawyer asked me how I felt about my father, and I looked right at Dad, and I said, I don't like him. I don't blame you. I don't either. Why didn't they let us in the courtroom except to testify? So you wouldn't influence each other's testimony. I really hate him for what he did. But I was careful not to show it, because I, I don't want him to go free. Me neither, but the evidence is overwhelming, Mike, so don't worry. He was bound over to circuit court to face murder charges. We'll have to testify again? Yes, but the prosecutor's on our side. The trial was scheduled for the following month in June. By then, school was out. All four of us older kids knew the importance of preparing for the case, so we spent a lot of time with the prosecutor, who was inexperienced, and he had never tried a murder case. He warned us that defense attorneys could be very callous towards victims. When the trial started, we each testified, again separately. Midway through the trial, the prosecutor called us brothers into the office, along with our uncle. Well, you're, you're all doing very well. You, you haven't let your dad intimidate you. He stares at me behind those sunglasses. Well, like I've said, we've never had a murder in town while I've been prosecutor, so this is my first time prosecuting one. Well, seems like a slam dunk to me. Well, <laughs> you, you, you never know. Defense attorneys are clever at using the law to their advantage. We know Dad's guilty, and we want justice for our mom. Well, so does the district attorney, Mike. Dad's lawyer is a jerk. Yeah, I can't believe he implied it was self-defense. Well, he's trying to plant seeds of doubt in the minds of the jurors, Mike. You, you know, I'm not at all certain we can get a first-degree murder conviction. You're kidding! No, I, I think we should give your dad a chance to plead to second degree. Yeah, meaning less prison time. We can make it part of the plea deal that he not be released till all six children reach the age of 18. So he'd serve at least 16 years. Well, we'd ask for a sentence of 25 to 30 years with no possibility of parole until the youngest child is 18. You boys uh, should make the decision. Yes. Why, why don't I leave you alone to discuss this? You know, the final decision is yours. My father accepted the plea deal admitted he shot mom and received a sentence of 25 to 30 years with no possibility of parole until my baby sister was 18. We left the courtroom feeling justice had been served. How ignorant of the law we were. That summer, my uncle and aunt moved into a bigger house to ease the stress, but it was still too much. All right, all right, quiet down. I have something to say. Hey, I have unhappy news, but... We can't find another way. Bickering's too much for us, so we have to split up the family. I'm sorry, but it's already been decided. When? Before school starts. Now, your Uncle Rex in Florida's agreed to take two of you. Mike, you'll stay here and go to school. Gary goes to Florida with Joyce. We'll keep the oldest and youngest girls because Amber can help take care of Rosie. Oh, Uncle Andrew, I don't want to leave. I'm sorry, but we have no choice. None of us understood the need to split up our family at such a critical time in our lives, but our uncle and aunt had tried their best with us. This was the early 70s, before our small town had crisis counseling and we rarely attended church. My older brother was going to church with his foster family, the Farmers. 
He seemed to adjust to life better than the rest of us. I started freshman year of high school and began working part-time on the same farm as my older brother. Sometimes, I spent the weekend there. We've enjoyed having your brother live with us, Mike. He's a big help to my husband. Well, we sure miss him, though. You kids have been through a lot. You have no idea. I can't imagine going through something like that without the Lord. He's our shepherd and our defender. He gives you such peace no matter what happens. Huh. The Bible says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Your brother goes to church with us. Would you like to go with us tomorrow? Uh, sure. Speaking of Jesus, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. What did John mean by that? Ever since Adam rebelled against God, we are all born in sin, cut off from God. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. There is only one cure, one hope for our sin nature, the blood of Jesus. Amen. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for us. According to 1 John chapter 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, you are dead in sin. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Regretfully, my heart was not open to the gospel. I was still processing the tragedy we endured. Increasingly, when I didn't spend the weekend at the farm, I isolated myself in my room and built model cars. During that time, my dad began sending me letters from prison. Another letter from your dad? Yes. Why does he keep writing to me? I hate him. Who knows? Perhaps to ease his guilt. He has no remorse for what he did. I made it clear how I felt about him. Has he asked forgiveness? No. It's full of accusations and lies about Mom. Here, you read it. Ah, oh, I see what you mean. Have you answered him? I wrote him back once or twice and told him to stop writing me, but he keeps writing. Oh, good grief. He says your mom would still be alive if you hadn't pulled the trigger. He's crazy. He refuses to take responsibility. Month after month, my father wrote, but I didn't answer. I just stuffed the letters in a box in my room. I was working more often at the farm, and by the next summer, when I was 15, I decided to leave my uncle's house and move to the farm where my older brother lived. Then, in the spring of my sophomore year, when I was 16, there came a new threat. You heard from the court, too? Yeah, I got the letter today. I can't believe they're granting him the right to appeal his murder conviction. How could that be? The law's a funny thing. It's unjust. He's guilty. He confessed in open court. Mike, the court wants you to turn over your dad's letters. What? I'm not going to do that. Why not? The letter shows how crazy he is. Yeah, he may try to plead insanity. The prosecutor thinks the letters could strengthen the case against your father. They have enough evidence already. He pled guilty in court. I'd give him the letters if I were you, Mike. I, I don't trust his lawyer, so, so I'm not going to do it. To the prosecutor's dismay, I burned each of those letters. Then, just before the trial, my father pled guilty to murder in the second degree. But we didn't know and we weren't told that the court reduced his sentence to 18 to 25 years and dropped their promise of no parole. Later that year, the court required my brother and sister to return to Michigan. For a while, my brother stayed with another farm couple in the area, and then he moved back with my uncle. You like living on that farm? 
Mm, it's all right. Guess you didn't get along down in Florida. Uncle Rex was on the road all the time, and I didn't like his wife telling me what to do. I wanted to die, Mike. Why? I miss Mom, I guess. I feel terrible all the time. Yeah, me too. If only I hadn't dropped the gun that night. <sighs> we were scared out of our minds, Gary. When Dad swung the shotgun at me, I ran too. How do you think I feel? Nothing we can do about it now. I'm just glad he's still in prison. I wish they'd never let him out. They will. I'll never forgive him for what he did. Me neither. He destroyed our family. I've been going to church a lot. And the preacher's always talking about love and forgiveness, not for Dad. You go to church, huh? Yeah, it's okay. I feel peaceful when I'm there. I remember going to Bible camp once. I asked Jesus to save me. I wish he'd have saved Mom. Yeah. I might be moving back to the farm. Why? Uncle Andrew has been so good to us. Yeah, I know. But he and his wife are splitting up. When my uncle and aunt divorced, two of my sisters came to the same farm where my older brother and I lived. Gary returned to the home of the other farmer in the area. Looking at our lives from the outside, we appeared to be doing okay. But we weren't. We needed long-term professional counseling, but it wasn't available, so our nightmare wasn't over. The summer before my junior year of high school, I went to Bible camp. It was a wonderful experience, including the preaching sessions. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You can have peace with God and be saved from his wrath to come if you come forward now and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I went forward to learn more about receiving Jesus, but the young man who spoke with me couldn't explain the plan of salvation. He wasn't sure what I needed to do, so I went back to my seat without knowing Jesus and quite confused. That night in my room, I tried to pray on my own, but didn't feel any different. I still felt anger, bitter, and empty inside. I began to rebel and was totally unprepared when two years later my father was granted a new trial. Would the nightmare never end? Next week, we'll hear the conclusion of Mike's testimony. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all listening friend. Remember that Jesus Christ loves you and gave his life blood to pay the penalty for your sin so you could be reconciled to God. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 promise that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. If you need help in making this crucial decision for Christ, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, www.unshackled.org.
This is program number 3,243. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Please take a moment to let us know you listen to these testimonies. Your letter is important to us. The address, Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. You may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and talk with someone who cares. 312-492-9410. Someone is waiting for your call. 312-492-9410. We would like for you to email us here, George C E. That's George C E at Comcast dot net. George C E at Comcast dot net. Drop us a line and tell us that you heard Unshackled on the George Espinlob show. We'll be right back for part two right after this. How do you do? When he was fourteen years old. The man in this story tried to prevent his father from killing his mother. He failed and was flooded with guilt and shame. Worse yet, he discovered after decades of rebellion that he had become just like his father until his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Bearing the good news, the truth that makes you free, this is Unshackled, true life stories of real people, dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Before going to Pacific Garden Mission, some homeless people try with all their might to change their dire situation. But it's not by might nor by power that a life is transformed, but by receiving truth. And the old lighthouse specializes in fertilizing barren ground with the imperishable seed. Each day, hundreds of men, women, and children seek shelter at the mission, receiving food, fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep, all given without charge, thanks to friends who send financial gifts. Even medical and dental care is given in the mission clinic to resident guests. The goal is not dependency on the mission, but on the one who begins a good work in them and will also perform it. And that same message goes out to the world in 14 languages through this program. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3,244 in the series Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Michael. Michael. Hey, Gary. Oh, I'm glad you could come here, too. Uh, summer camp has to be a lot easier than working the farm. Yeah, I am sick of farm work. I, I can't wait to graduate. Oh, me, too. Listen, you've been to this camp before. Do they make you go to religious meetings? Yeah, we'll, we'll go together. Uh, let's get a dorm room together, too. Huh? Uh, yeah, maybe we can even work together. Come on, let's check in. Y- you like your foster family? They're okay. The Burks worked me half to death, especially after I got into trouble at school. I heard about the firecracker at the basketball game. Yeah, my buddy stared me to set it off, and the police jumped on me like fleas on a dog. Yeah, was it worth it? Being suspended from school for three days? No. Uh, the Burks grounded me and gave me a ton of work to do. If only Dad hadn't done what he did. I don't even want to hear his name, Gary. I, I, you know what? I wish he was dead instead of Mom. Two brothers separated by tragedy, reunited at summer camp. This is the story of how their mother's murder impacted the life of Michael Millard. His true testimony, right now on Unshackled. 
I was 17 that summer, and I'd lived for two years with the Burks, a farming couple. They had taken in my older brother and two younger sisters, but they had three children of their own, so I never felt as if they cared about me, and I became bitter. Nothing got their attention. If I did well or poorly in class, they didn't notice. I made the baseball team, but they didn't come to my games. Nobody cared. My younger brother, Gary, was with a different farm family, so I was glad to spend the summer with him working at a Christian camp in New York. We were assigned to buildings and grounds. And we thought this would be easier than farming? <laughs> yeah. I'm beginning to think that all Christians are just hypocrites. They tell you one thing and then do something else. Yeah, the guys here sure like to boss you around. Like Dad. I don't like their attitude. I feel like slave labor. What is it with people anyway? Always trying to control others. Do this, don't do that. It's just like the Burks. Just like Dad. And just like that evangelist last night. Get saved or face hell fire. Everything seems to hinge on surrendering your heart and life to Jesus. Yeah, I tried that last year. Didn't work. I'm no different. I have fond memories of that summer with my brother. Being trash collectors, we filled our dorm room with soda can collections. We, we had to tar and seal the roof of the main auditorium, which had a sloping roof. My brother fell off, but didn't get hurt, and we had a good laugh. At the end of the summer, we went back to our farming families, and I started my senior year of high school. That fall, the Burks decided to attend a seminar out of town, leaving me in charge of the farm. The first day I drove his pickup truck to school and parked. Who uh, uh, taught you to drive, you jerk? L look what you did to my truck! Uh, it isn't even mine! But I'm gonna get blamed. What an idiot you are! Calm down, Mike. Look what he did! Well, yeah, yeah, we saw the whole thing. It wasn't your fault and it can be fixed. Look, you don't know Mr. Burke! Come on, let's skip school. You need a break, dude. I didn't know how to make good decisions and went along with their idea. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. We drove all over the countryside and I managed to tear off a large mirror on the passenger side. When the Burks came home, I lied instead of telling the truth. At first, they believed me, but the truth came out. Mike, you lied to me. You skipped school and drove my truck all over the countryside. People saw you and told me, so there's no use denying it. Yeah, but some kid did sideswipe me at school. Uh, right after I parked, I got witnesses. Maybe, but why should I believe that story? Too many people saw you. From now on, you go to school and come straight home and do your chores. No privileges. My relationship with him would never be the same. Although I was a senior, the Burks never discussed my future. I was accepted at Bible college, but didn't know how I'd pay tuition. All I wanted was a normal life, but I didn't even know what was normal. In the spring, I made the varsity baseball team and did well, but nobody came to see me play, so no one shared my joy and excitement. Graduation came and went. I wanted to spend the summer with my friends, but I had to work on the farm. By August, I was fed up. I need to talk to you, Mr. Burke. What about? In June, I volunteered to handle the irrigation in the morning, and you agreed to handle it in the evening so I could spend time with my friends. But I've been doing the morning and evening setup as well as breakdowns during the day. You haven't kept your end of the bargain. I'm busy. What? Well, the, the summer's gone, and, and I still haven't spent any time with my friends. So, I want to skip the first semester of college and spend time with my friends. If you don't go to college, you have to move out. What? That's, that isn't fair. You heard me. That's final. That night, I packed my things and loaded them into my car. My foster dad gave me my share of mom's life insurance money, enough to get me started at college. I brooded about being punished for lying and then punished for his lies, his failure to keep his word. Life was a struggle to survive in an uncaring world. 
I rented a room in a boarding house for a week and hung out with my friends. During the second week, I heard that my dad had been granted a new trial. A new trial? Twice he stood in front of a judge and described how he brutally murdered mom and they let him appeal anyway. What's to appeal if he confessed? Exactly. Uh, the court accepted his guilty plea and sentenced him to prison. We thought it was over, but they lied to us and even reduced his sentence. Mike, will you have to testify again? Yeah. The last two times, we kids had to testify separately. But this time, we get to listen to each other. It's been four years, but I hate my dad more than ever. I didn't know that whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer in God's eyes. But I had pushed God out of my life. As I testified, I mostly looked at the jury. I wanted them to know that we wanted justice for our mother. But whenever I responded to questions about my father, I stared directly at him. I wanted him to see the hatred in my heart, to feel the pain he caused. After a week, the case went to the jury. My siblings and I hung out in court while the jury deliberated. But there was no new evidence. Why did the court allow this? There is no justice. That's why the law protects the criminal more than the victim. Well, surely he won't get off. I better not. The man is evil. And they, they, they better not give him parole. They, they promised to keep him locked up until we were all 18. Seeing him brought back all those memories. How he used to beat us with his belt until we had welts. Yeah, remember when the beating stopped hurting and we laughed? So he came back and he beat us some more? I hate that man. He terrified mom so much before he finally killed her. The jury reached a verdict. Well, that didn't take long. 45 minutes. Again, the verdict was guilty, and Dad went back to prison. That was the last time we had to testify in court, but not the last time we had to deal with Dad. Discouraged and bitter, I joined the military where I drank and used drugs. A year later, I came home on leave, met a girl, and we married. I was 19 and still making irresponsible decisions. We had a daughter, but less than three years later, we were divorced. My bitterness grew. I got into barroom brawls and one night was arrested for assault. My older brother bailed me out of jail again. So what happened, Mike? A couple of drunks tried to cut me off the road, so I followed him home and I punched him out. My buddy almost killed one of them. Man, how did you plead in court? Guilty. Sentencing is next week. I hope you don't go to prison. I'm a little worried. It's not my first offense, you know. Yeah, I know. I could lose visitation with Amber. Ever since my ex got remarried, she limited my visits. Last time, I had to go to their home and spend time with Amber in their presence. Now she wants to let her husband adopt Amber. You know, you could lose all of your parenting rights. I told her no way. But this assault charge? It would change everything. Too bad. Yeah. But I don't want Amber growing up seeing hostility between her mother and, and me, like dad and mom. I signed the paperwork, letting my daughter's stepfather adopt her. Another bad decision. I had gone to church while living with the Burks, but now I wanted nothing to do with God. Now my bitter mind was steeped in alcohol and drugs, adding to my confusion. I had become more and more like Dad. A week later, I went to court. Young man, you have quite a record for your age. Driving on a suspended license, driving under the influence, public intoxication, reckless driving, leaving the scene of an accident, damage to public property, and now assault with the intent to do great bodily harm. I sentence you to 120 days in the county jail, five years probation, anger management counseling, and restitution of $6,800. You'll not consume alcohol while you're on probation. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. If you violate these terms, if you as much as spit on the sidewalk, I'll send you to prison. Shortly, we'll hear the conclusion of Mike's tragic story. The pride of life is gone from many men who come to Pacific Garden Mission. Once boastful and arrogant, they've learned through hard lessons 
that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. They need help, and the men's division provides a safety net of support while they learn a new way to live. The men's division offers classes and counseling to help each man face the reality of how he came to be homeless and to make the changes needed to succeed where once they failed. Some men stay only a few nights, some a few months. Others sign on to the Bible program and stay longer, serving in various ways at the mission or working at jobs in the community. As they grow in knowledge, they learn diligence, temperance, and patience to regard one another's needs instead of hurting one another. Consider your ways, they are told, and they do. To learn more about this vital ministry to men, write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. While I was on probation and seeing psychologists for my anger problems, my father was suddenly released on parole, having served only 10 years of his sentence. No one told us siblings, and I was furious. My transformation into Dad's likeness was nearly complete. I went to see my probation officer. Sit down, Michael. Did you see the psychologist I recommended? Yeah, but he was no better than the first two guys. He's highly qualified in anger management. He hasn't helped me one bit. These guys don't have a clue about dealing with the things that I've been through. I can recommend a psychiatrist. What about my dad? What about him? Well, he was released on parole, and I'm furious about it. The court promised us he wouldn't get out until all us kids were 18, and my little sister's only 14. They lied to us. They, they also promised they'd let us know, and they didn't. Mm. How did you find out? Dad had the nerve to go to my older brother's place of work. They got into an argument and then started a fist fight. Somebody called the cops. Ah, sounds like a parole violation. Yeah, it was, but all he got was a warning. Dad got away with murdering my mother, and now he gets away with violating his parole. Well, the system isn't perfect. The system failed. And you wonder why I have anger problems? For several weeks, Dad tried to contact my three younger sisters, first by phone, then by driving past the homes where they lived. Fearful of him, the families informed the court, but Dad was not punished. He didn't try to reach my younger brother and me, perhaps because we had fought him the night he killed Mom. I decided to take action. After work one day, I drove to his neighborhood, knocked on doors, and asked where he lived. Soon, I found his mobile home and saw him in the yard. Michael! You got a beer? Sure. Come inside. That's my new wife, Hillary. Yeah, I, Sit I, down. I, okay, I want to talk to you about some things. Ground rules. You've been trying to see my sisters, and that'll stop. Completely. If you want to stay alive. Who do you think you are telling me what to do? I'm your son. And I'm just as capable of murdering you as you did my mother ten years ago. Listen to the big man. Here all talk. Shut up! I have a right to see my kids. You gave up all rights to your children the night you pulled the trigger and killed my mother. Think you're a tough guy, huh? We'll see about that. <sighs> I don't pick on women and children like you. I had a fight with your cousin one night, and I left him curled up in a ball on the ground. Think you're man enough to take me on, huh? I'm not the 14-year-old boy you tossed around like a rag doll. I'll kill you. Don't you threaten me. This is not a threat. It is a promise. If you ever... Come near my sisters and brothers again. I'll kill you with my bare hands, and it will be a slow and painful death. His wife tried to come to his defense, but I told her to shut up, that the conversation was between me and my father, and none of her business. I reminded her that she had married a murderer and asked her to leave the room. Finally, it was just the two of us. Without blinking, I looked him straight in the eye as I talked. If you think you can come here and scare me, you're mistaken. Shut up and listen. Unlike what you did to my mother, I'm giving you a choice between life and death. If you ever try seeing my sisters or brothers again, I will hunt you down like a dog and kill you. This is your only warning. If we ever meet again, it will be the last breath you ever take. The choice is yours. 
He knew I meant what I said. As I drove away that night, my body was trembling. I had become just like him. I knew that I was capable of murder. That was the last time I saw my father alive, and he didn't bother any of us again. Five years later, he died. All six of us siblings walked into his funeral together, showing the world our strength. I had remarried, but that marriage lasted only nine months. After the divorce, I married a third time, trying to be noble when she got pregnant. That marriage lasted four years. Then, I lived with a woman for several years before we married. My fourth marriage lasted five years. I longed for a family and a normal home, but didn't know how to make it happen. You have a knack for picking the wrong women, Mike. <laughs> Tell me about it. None of them was faithful. Well, at least you're friends with your daughter's mother. Yeah. She meets me halfway, unlike my first wife. Your wife now? My soon-to-be ex. Yeah, that one. I, I thought you two were seeing a marriage counselor. We tried, and then I found out she's been seeing her ex-husband. Bummer. Yeah, just when I thought I had it all together. My own business, new cars, a boat, a nice home. I'm going to lose it all. You'll make a comeback. Yeah, but I hate being alone. My last divorce was final in 2000. I'd been married four times for a total of 12 years. Half of those years were spent alone, and the other half in heartache. By then I was 44 years old and full of pride, a pig wallowing in filth. I found a job with a good income, was laid off, and found a better one. Then I was arrested for driving under the influence. I was on a self-destructive path, and I didn't know how to stop. I learned the answer driving back and forth to work, listening to Christian radio. God says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. You see, sin is the problem, and Jesus is the answer. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Folks, he called us sheep because sheep are dumb. They fall down and can't get back up on their own. They need a shepherd. They get lost and fall prey to wolves. And that's why Jesus said, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, the thief is Satan, our adversary. He wants to kill your desire for holiness and destroy your hope of peace and eternal life in heaven. Jesus said in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You see, God warned us in Ezekiel chapter 18 that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. That's why God sent Jesus to die in our place. The penalty had to be paid, and only Jesus could pay the full price for our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ, he becomes your shepherd. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Day after day, as I listened to God's word, God's Holy Spirit began to pierce my heart. I saw my sinful condition, the bitterness, arrogance, and pride. And one day in 2001, I made the best decision of my life. I repented of sin and received Jesus Christ as my Savior. He led me to a church that taught the Bible, verse by verse, and I grew in knowledge and faith. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Forgive my father? Can I really do that? 
Arriving home one night after work, I was so convicted of my sin that I fell on my knees before the Lord with tears streaming down my face. Heavenly Father, I do forgive my dad for what he did to me. I forgive him for the pain and the hurt he caused me. Most of all, Father, I forgive him for murdering my mother. I pray, dear God, that you will heal me and remove the anger and bitterness from my heart. Lord, I confess my sins against you and ask your forgiveness for holding that anger and bitterness in my heart. And Father, I pray that you'll help my siblings to find your peace too. Hello? Hey, Gary, how you doing? Okay, Mike. Ah, the Lord brought me to a place where I finally forgave Dad. There isn't much point in holding on to bitterness, is there? You only hurt yourself. I can see that now. The devil's a master at beating us up with the past. I know. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, you're getting to be a real Bible student, Mike. I'm teaching in a home fellowship now. Getting your life together. Jesus got my life together. He never gave up on me, and neither did you. I knew you'd make it. I wasn't at all sure until Jesus saved me. I blamed everyone but me for years. Turns out evil can't be cured by worldly means. That's why Jesus told us to love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. I still don't understand why Mom had to die. But I've learned a lot about the past. What insights do you have? Well, no matter what the circumstances are, God's faithful. Amen. And I also think we need to surround ourselves with other believers. They pray for us and show us how to follow the Lord. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what the Burks tried to do. In retrospect, they did the best they could. Yeah. We kids were also troubled. But the Lord has always loved us. In 2006, I married a believer, my first marriage in Christ. We started a biblically-based ministry to women and children who've been victims of violence. Ours is a message of hope in Christ. He makes all the difference. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listening friend, are you saved? Do you know Christ Jesus as your Savior and Lord? That's the question God will ask you when you stand before him. What did you do with my son? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, Jesus took your judgment and condemnation to the cross. The Bible promises in Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The choice is yours. If you need help in making this crucial decision for Christ, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, www.unshackled.org. A listener emailed us, Your radio program reminds me that even in the hardest times, God is there and He cares. We agree and hope that you ask the manager of this station to keep broadcasting unshackled. This is program number 3244. Heard in the true story of Michael Millard, part two, were Michael Walner, Evan Armacost, Lanny Lutz, Tim Frank, and David Stewart. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound, Nadine Aloysio Sorensen. Engineer, Kim Rasmussen. Script by Kenitha Gabler. Directed by Don Stroop. And I'm Tim Gregory. 
Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Please write today. Your letter means a great deal to us. The address, Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. You may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and talk with someone who cares. 312-492-9410. Someone is waiting for your call. 312-492-9410.
Shelly Wilson, Love Lifted Me. Tomorrow night on the George Espinlob Show, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, right here on the Spreaker Network. We'll have a man by the name of Milo Piled. I think I'm saying that right. No, I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. He is the son of a Israeli general. And he has much to say. So tune in tomorrow night, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, here on the Spreaker Network, when we have Mr. Milo Piled, the son of an Israeli general. I think you'll find it very, very interesting. I sure hope that you enjoyed tonight's episode of Unshackled, the Michael Millard story. I know I did. And as you listen to these true stories of real individuals, I want you to know that I'm listening to them for the first time myself. And so I'm just as intrigued and I'm just as interested as you are in listening to these true accounts of real individuals that in the end, they became unshackled. We found a song this afternoon that that perhaps, I guess, says it all. And we'd like to play it. And we'd like to dedicate it to every single man, woman, boy, and girl that's listening to Unshackled tonight and that will be listening to Unshackled, the Michael Millard story, later on. This is dedicated to everyone.
wasn't that pretty? If you want to write to Unshackled, just simply address your letter to Unshackled, 1458 South Canal, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. If you'd like to call them, 312-492-9410. Their website is simply unshackled.org, unshackled.org. And if you want to email them, unshackled at pgm.org, unshackled at pgm.org. And you know what else? We here on the George Espen Love Show would like to hear from you. Just simply drop us a line, drop us an email, and tell us that you heard Unshackled here on the George Espen Love Show. George C E. That's George C E at Comcast.net. George C E at Comcast.net. I hope that you enjoyed this special Wednesday night edition of Unshackled and the Michael Millard story. We'll be back tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And we'll have a guest by the name of Milo Piled, who is the son of an Israeli general. And he'll be talking to us about some very important issues. So tune in tomorrow night. Friday night is just, well, Friday night. Friday nights are somewhat different around here. Sometimes we have two guests. Sometimes we have one. Sometimes we have none. But we always have something going on. And I do want to say this. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being there. We know. We know that we're reaching people. And we know that you're reaching back to us. And that's what it's all about. That's what we want to do. We want to reach out and touch people. And we want people to reach back and touch us. So send us that email, George C E at Comcast dot net. George C E at Comcast dot net. And there I go trying to think and talk at the same time and it just doesn't work. <laughs> from all of us here, seriously, from all of us here. All the fine folks that make this show. We send our love to you. We send our appreciation to you. Wherever you're at, whatever you might be going through, trust me, we care about you. We know that you care about us. If it's nighttime where you're at, you have a terrific night. If it's already tomorrow, you have a fine, fine day. But wherever you're at and whatever it is, until tomorrow night, same time, same station, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, right here on the Spreaker Network. Tune in for another George Espinlob show, and we'll do our best. We'll do our very best to help you enjoy it. That's a promise. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans, and countrymen, <laughs> you have a safe, safe night or a safe, safe day. And until then, this is George Espinlob saying good night, and God just richly bless you real, real good. Good night, everybody.
Yeah. 